So we're going to look at Homer's Odyssey. I realize that some of you had a little difficulty getting the book. I see some of you have it. And um, if that is you, uh, Robert Fagel's translation is online, the PDF. I can send it to you. This is the one I'll be using, though. It's Lattimore's translation, which I think is superior, uh, the best of its time. And it's been around for a while. It's a poetic achievement in itself, because we're dealing with a translation into English. Uh, where shall I begin with this? Um, so Homer's Odyssey is based on uh, the story of a, an event which um, alongside, although to a lesser degree, um, the account of uh, told in scripture is a transformative event in Western culture, which is the Battle of Troy between the Greeks and the Trojans and uh, what transpired from it. It's just a historical event. However, um, it passed into myth and legend. And the myth and legend is what made it what it is. It's not the battle itself, it's the retelling of that battle which made it the transformative event that it thereafter became. Uh, Homer has two goes at the account of the Battle of Troy. One is the battle itself, the events leading up to it, etc. That's called the Iliad by Homer as well. And that one is before this one. And the second is this work which we're looking at here, the Odyssey. Now the Iliad, Ilium, uh, name for Troy there, uh, is, uh, begins in the middle of the whole battle, actually. It's a 10 year battle. That's a long war around a city. And it begins uh, nine years in, more so, with the main figure among the Greeks, Achilles, whom you've heard of, refusing to fight, thrown down his tools, pouting, upset, refusing to fight anymore. Um, so it begins, the first word of the Ili Iliad is wrath, the wrath of Achilles. He's angry. Why is he angry? Well, we're going to find out. Basically, the chief of the Greeks, whose name is Agamemnon, we will hear about him here as well, has taken his prize, who's a girl, um, out of a little selfish dispute between them. Agamemnon chose whose boss, well, I'm going to take your prize then. And Achilles says, you're going to take my prize. I'm not going to fight for you anymore. If I, if, you, if I don't fight for you, you can't win this fight. And so he uh, sits there and in a uh, magnificent sulk, petulantly refusing to fight. But, of course, Achilles is the greatest of the Greek warriors, and they can't win the Battle of Troy without him. Now, you know about Achilles from the Achilles heel. Talk about it in English. That is not told in the Iliad. So even outside the Iliad and the Odyssey, there are accounts of the Battle of Troy and what happened there. That's how significant the event is culturally. We don't even hear about Achilles' death for that matter, let alone that he's shot in the heel. That's not even mentioned in, in Homer. But uh, Achilles, the warrior, is the centerpiece of this battle. And it, as I say, it's a 10-year war, the 10 years leading up to it. Among those combatants, the fighters there amongst the Greeks, is a fellow by the name of Odysseus, who's the hero of this one. So the Iliad was really rooted in the uh, discussion of Achilles and his prowess. He's the main figure. Odysseus is a, an important minor character. Uh, here it's all on, on uh, Odysseus. That account is a, is a war tale. It's really about battle. I, I chose not to use that, and although in some ways you could say the Iliad is the great work of Western literature. I've rather chosen to tell one of the tales, and that's the account of the Odyssey. So the 10 years leading up to the war, and including the wars in the Iliad, the Odyssey is the 10 years after the war. 
So it's a 20 year time span. And, and we're going to now, the Odyssey, in case you're wondering the title, is the return of Odysseus, uh, of Odysseus from Troy. Let's say over here, it's a, over here, right here, this is Troy. It's in modern day Turkey, a little up from the coastland. You can't tell that on the map, it's a little fuzzy over there. But up from the coastland, I said it was a myth and legend that, about the Battle of Troy. Some actually thought that it was only a myth and a legend. There was no historical basis for it. The, the, the city of Troy was not discovered, even though it's mentioned. Where is it? Where are the signs of this? Well, it was discovered in the 19th century by an architect by the name of Schliemann, um, following an English um, archaeologist. And they discovered the ruins of Troy and all of the artifacts that were buried there, etc., which told us that this was, in fact, a historical event, not just a myth and a legend. The myth and the legend is more important than the actual event, however. We will find that it's central to Greeks' identity. Remember, in terms of biblical times, the Greeks are a significant force. Alexander the Great, they conquer the whole known world. They bring Greek culture everywhere they go. Even in script, the times of scripture, the New Testament is written in Greek, even though we're in the Roman Empire. It's interesting. It's part of the architectural layering of cultures, but now Greek, Greek is the, the language that the literate speak and write in the authors of the New Testament, um, many of whom are Jews, are writing in Greek. That's the, and, and the Old Testament is translated into Greek. But the Greek empire fell when Alexander the Great died, so it's like 323 BC. And the New Testament is written, you know, 30, 350 years later. It's a long time, but Greek culture is still of significance. It's one of the reasons it, it remains of significance to us as well. But I, I said that uh, it was important culturally for the Greeks. It's also important culturally for the Romans. We're going to find that out when we come to read Virgil's Aeneid. Because Virgil's Aeneid is the account of somebody on the other side. One of the Trojans, whose name was Aeneas. And he left, and he ended up coming around and founding the city of Rome, or the, he didn't found it, but he was the, the beginnings of that, like Remus and Romulus founded the city of Rome. But there, they were his, but this was the Trojans who left the battle uh, ruins of Troy, and they started, it. so they go back to their, the Romans go back in their account of the fall of Troy. So now we have the Greek and the Roman empires all tracing back to this uh, decisive event. So you can see why it's significant. And then there are tales outside of it even. So culturally, enormously significant because of course the Roman Empire, Latin is the lingua franca for the, the church, the Western church for over 1500 years. And the Eastern church, uh, they write in Greek. So these events are sort of bedrock, foundational. Uh, you want to talk about um, culture's work in terms of they build on foundations, the foundations, that's what we're talking about here, and that's why we're doing it in uh, at Tyndale in the year 2022, yeah, because it's foundational to um, other European cultures and uh, North American cultures as well, uh, and its influence on the English language. Well, we're going to see that in uh, some of the later works we'll look at in this semester. But uh, this, this decisive event is called the Odyssey, uh, captured in this epic, and it is an epic. Let me talk a bit about an epic. Say a few words about it. I'm going to expand on the epic when we get to Virgil's Aeneid. Then I will talk more specifically about the features of an epic. Um, and uh, we'll, I'll write them on the board and number them and so forth. And the conventions are important because the conventions are basically the notes or the tune that is played that identifies it as an epic. An epic is a long narrative poem. But there are a lot of not long narrative poems that aren't epics. So that's insufficient to tell us what an epic is. It's not just a long narrative poem, although it is. So one of the things you like about the Odyssey, it's a story. 
When I tell you it's a poem, you roll your eyes and say, oh no. When I tell you it's a story, you say, oh good. When I tell you that it was written about events that took place probably in 1200 BC, you're gonna roll your eyes and say, oh no. When I tell you that every person who has studied has been influenced by these works, and usually will make explicit references to it, you might say, that's interesting. Um, but the Odyssey is an epic, and an epic has certain features. I'll just talk about a few of them, but I already mentioned one. It was in the Iliad. It began in the middle of the account. It's year nine of the Trojan War. It only lasts 10 years. Where in year nine? I don't know exactly the dates, but it's year nine. And it begins right in the middle of things. And then it backtracks, just like uh, often in uh, detective novels or something, you begin with a crime. Right? begins with the crime, and somebody's dead, right? CSI, that sort of thing. It begins with the crime, and then it backtracks and tells us the events that led up to the event we saw right at the outset, right? That tends to be a pattern. It's a consistent, here's the way you tell one of these stories, and you expect that to be the case. You're, not, you're neither disappointed or bored by it. It's okay. So here's the, and it's, it's emphasizing a decisive moment in a detective story, well obviously somebody's dead, that's pretty important, especially for the person who died. But it's also the subject of interest, so how did this terrible event happen? What led up to it? Well that's the, that's the background. So we will get in the Odyssey, just like in the Iliad, the background. What led up to the point where Achilles is outside the uh, city walls of Troy refusing to fight, because that's a funny old thing for a great hero to be doing, is refusing to fight. How did it get to this point? And then, only then, once we get to the, giving us the background, then we're going to launch forward what happens from that point. In the Odyssey, it begins in the middle of things once again. But in this sense, it's in the middle of the life of Odysseus. And more importantly, his son, whose son, whose name is Telemachus. I got my black marker now, the red one, it's not visible, but his name is Telemachus. Because here's an interesting thing. This is a war story, but war stories have more people involved than simply those who are fighting. The central figure here, as I say, his name is Odysseus. He's been away from home for 20 years. And who has he left behind? And what happened to those people while he was away? Who are they and what happened to them? He was the king, the prince of uh, uh, Ichthia. Um, and uh, when he left, the whole uh, country suffered in his absence. There's nobody there to preserve the rule of law. In uh, Greek times, the ruler is also the judge. He executes justice, like quite literally, with the sword. He will be the, the dispenser of justice. In, uh, in our legal tradition, we follow the biblical model where the uh, political power is separated from the legislative branch. The judges are not the same people as the politicians. There's a separation of powers. Again, that follows the uh, Old Testament in its dis distinction there. They're, they're very distinct roles. They have spheres in which they operate and they, they need so some uh, independence there. Uh, we don't have that in ancient Greece. The king, is also the judge. People will bring their cases to him and he will judge and also dispense the justice. So when Odysseus leaves Ithaca, not Ithaca or whatever I said, Ithaca, when he leaves Ithaca, Ithaca is left without anybody to administer justice or to rule. And he has left behind two very important people. One of them is his wife, whose name is Penelope. The other, who's the main subject of interest here, is his son Telemachus, 
who he never saw. He left when his wife Penelope was pregnant. He's never seen his son. His son has grown up without a father. So what we have here is the story not only of a, a war hero who has been traumatized by the post-traumatic stresses of war, say PTSD now. We also have a family that he's left behind that's at, at least equally traumatized by growing up without a father or husband and having a kingdom which is growing more and more hostile in his absence. And we have figures there who are the, the bad guys, as it were. They're the suitors. Suitors, as in they are trying to marry his wife. He's been gone 20 years. He's dead. She's the queen of Ithaca. I want to be king. I'm going to marry her. She doesn't want to marry me. Too bad. I'm going to marry her and call her my queen and I'll be the king. I'll be the, the head honcho. This is how the Odyssey begins, with domestic tragedy. So there it was the public square, the public sphere, grand war, battles and so forth. Extraordinary as it, were, as it is as well. The Iliad really is a great work. Um, the Odyssey is a little different. Now when we, I use the word Odyssey, obviously it's related to Odysseus. Right? His name, Odysseus. The Odyssey, of course, Odysseus. But you associate with an Odyssey a very trying, lengthy journey. Boy, that was an Odyssey. Named after this work. This is the archetypal Odyssey, which people to this day refer to when they're thinking about a very challenging, long-standing journey. And how did we get there and how did we get back? They think about the Odyssey. It's one of the uh, experiences of life. People talk about pilgrimages, but an odyssey is a different thing than a pilgrimage. And this work um, is, the, is the prototype for that. So we, it begins, as I say, in the middle of things. In the middle of the Trojan War is over, and guess what's happened in the interim? Well, 10 years have passed. It's about year 19 of the odyssey as well. We're coming to the conclusion of the 20 years. We're not there yet. We're gonna go, we're gonna do a backtrack to how we got to the point where Odysseus can't get home. That because that's his problem. He can't get home. The other Trojan heroes have gone home. So Agamemnon has gone home. And Menelaus has gone home. And others have gone home. We're gonna meet Agamemnon and Menelaus, by the way. And we will also meet Achilles. We'll meet him in the underworld, which is roughly speaking over here. In Spain, where else would the underworld be? <laughs> Don't know what it has to do with that. I mean, these are speculation based on uh, scholarly observations about descriptions of things and so forth. I don't think it's authoritative in any way. Um, but he's going to meet those heroes, but the, the point is those heroes have returned home, but not Odysseus. And Odysseus, this is a problem. Obviously on a personal front, he hasn't got home. Obviously for his family, he hasn't got home. But for one other reason, it's because in order for a hero to be a hero in Greek times, we have to know what he has done and said in public. He can't just disappear. That's not very heroic. At the moment, he, he's, he is not the man he is supposed to be. He's hidden away from public sight. Nobody knows what happened to the great Odysseus. Odysseus, by the way, is the one who concocted the idea of the Trojan horse. Man known for his strategies and cleverness and wisdom. And he hasn't come home. And what happened to him? Nobody knows. This is a problem for him because he can't achieve his life's great ambition in this. And here I'm going to talk about something related to the Greek conception of uh, human identity, which is, when I say human identity, the identity of the men of the day is that they are trying to achieve greatness. To live a human life is to live a life that is like the immortals, the gods, worthy of remembrance. 
people are going to talk about these people long after they are dead that's how they want to live their life it's not enough that they are rich happy whatever who cares are they memorable are people going to talk about them well if you don't know how Odysseus story even ends nobody's going to talk about Odysseus in praiseworthy terms and that is what the heroes are after so this is part of Greek excellence this word arete which is some sort of excellence for an action hero is to have the whole of their life narrated recounted from beginning to end that hasn't happened here Odysseus's story has not yet been told we're gonna to find out why when we come to book five I'll deal with that next class but nobody knows what's happened to Odysseus and he's not home and so it begins in the middle of things and it begins with another epic convention which we'll see in the Iliad it's also in the Odyssey it's also in every Greco-Roman epic and it begins with the Council of the Gods this is the uh, machinery of the epic the God's will is being done in these events. Problem, how can it be said that the God's will is being done if Odysseus, who always honored the gods, is not home? That doesn't seem right. Not right. And how can we say that the gods uh, honor those that honor them if Odysseus, who honored the gods, is has disappeared and nobody knows where he is and his family's left destitute and his kingdom is left to the ravages of the suitors and he's dishonored in his own country how can that be this is a terrible conclusion so we begin in the middle of things with uh, these lines with another epic convention by the way which is uh, an inv the invocation of the muse so let me say about something about this sorry I'll repeat these when we come to the Aeneid. Invocation of the Muse is another feature. The Muses are gods themselves, and there are nine of them. And they're the goddesses, their mother, her name is Memory. And each of the Muses represents a certain type of writing, or music, or art. There's an epic muse. And so what he's calling upon the muse to do is to help him remember. Because he is, and this is one of the features here of, of the epic, is it's telling a tale that's beyond human telling. That's what effectively is being implied. If I have to call upon the gods to help me to tell the tale I'm going to tell, I'm saying this is a tale that will interest the gods. It's worthy of their telling, and by appealing to the epic muse, it's worthy of the account called an epic, which is the greatest account that could be told. Tell me, muse, of the man of many ways, who was driven far, far journeys after he had sacked Troy's sacred citadel. Many were those whose cities he saw, whose minds he learned of, many the pains he suffered in his spirit on the wide sea, struggling for his own life and the homecoming of his companions. Even so, he could not save his companions. Hard though he strove to, they were destroyed by their own wild recklessness. Fools who devoured the oxen of Helios, the sun god, and he took away the day of their homecoming. From some point here, goddess, daughter of Zeus, speak and begin our story. And then she begins. So who is telling this? The muse is telling the story. This is a, this is a revelation of sorts. Now, what the gods are doing is they're telling a story about this. What they're not doing, which the Bible does, is revealing God to us. We are not, as it says in scripture, scripture when it talks about revelation is God himself is being revealed to us, not just his words, 
an account of his deeds but he himself is present in the revelation that's not being asserted here it's just that this is a very special type of story when i say that it's a special type of story it involves very special type of language which we call epic diction diction you know the word dictionary epic language the form of the epic diction is a uh, type of poetry called um, uh, dactylic hexameter never mind it has a certain beat to it and it keeps the beat throughout the whole poem it's the the, the rhythm of the poem that's why it's poetry and it and the repetitiveness of that meter gives it a quality that allows you to remember it as well. You know how it's easy to remember rhyme than it is non-rhyme thing like pop songs, you remember the lyrics? It's because they're rhyme. And also they have a meter. And the regularity helps you to remember it. These poems would have been recounted and sung by somebody who would memorize the entire thing. It's 24 books. This is a lot of memory work. They would have been recited and sung by someone. So the epic diction is part of that meter. Now, this particular meter is reserved for epic. People don't normally write in dactylic hexameter, but the epic poet does. Also, we'll find epic similes. Well, I'll, I'll illustrate those when we come to along to it. But the, but the goddess, the muse, is now going to tell us the tale of, of what follows and how we got to this point. And note that he, one final thing, he mentioned a homecoming. There's a Greek word for this. It's really interesting. A one-word Greek word. Nostos. From which we get our English word nostalgia. When you think about nostalgia, you're thinking about the aching towards the past. When you think of nostalgia, you're, you're thinking about times in the past. You wish things were the way they used to be. That's nostalgia, you're sort of thinking backwards. But you're not thinking about home necessarily or the pain of being away from home, whereas that's what this is. That's the algae, by the way, is actually pain. We call it homesickness in English. You're away from home for the first time, some of you. Maybe you have homesickness. It's not the same thing as here, but it's a little bit like it. You're away from things that are familiar. There's a little bit of ache that goes with that, or a little sense of things aren't quite right, and I'm not sure how to cope with that. This is what Odysseus experienced, magnified by 20 years, but also he lost his whole identity in the process. He's a man who does not know himself when we first meet him. And we, by the way, just, I think I said, we're not gonna meet him until book five. Book one, is going to be back in Ithaca at the court and we will meet Penelope and his wife but before that we come to the council of the gods so the tale begins and I'll just read here then all the others as many as fled sheer destruction were at home now all the gods all, all the heroes were back home having escaped the sea and the fighting this one alone longing for his wife and his homecoming was detained by the queenly nymph Calypso. Oh, so now it's been given away. You know what a Calypso is? It's like a sort of Latin, Latino dance. It's, that's true. But Calypso here means something more important. So I'm doing a lot of Greek here, but I find the Greek fascinating. We, we use it in various English words, but the one that you will best know a eucalyptus tree gives you good shade it hides you from the sun Calypso the nymph is hiding Odysseus from the eyes of the world nobody knows where he is an apocalypse is a revelation think of the revelation of John it's called the apocalypse it's not about catastrophic, we associate apocalypse with a catastrophic event. It really means to take something that was hidden and reveal it. You're pulling it out from being hidden. The genre of apocalyptic does that in literature. There's a few 
books in scripture that are written that way. One of them is Revelation. But Calypso has detained him, bright among goddesses, in her hollowed caverns, desiring that he should be her husband. But when in the circling of the years, that very year came in which the gods had spun for him his time of homecoming to Ithaca, not even then was he free of his trials, nor among his own people. But all the gods pitied him, except Poseidon. He remained relentlessly angry with God like Odysseus until his return to his own country. Okay, so a lot of information has been given here. Reference to the spinning of years. 17. The gods had spun for them. This is the fates. I need to say, so I'll say more about this when we come to uh, talk about the tragedy. But they have a fatalistic worldview. I talked about this. They believe that everything is ordained, that really the human freedom to some degree is a mirage. You cannot change what is fated. And the fates are portrayed as gods. There are three of them, and one of them spins out your fate. The other draws it, and the other clips it. So when your life's over, the big scissors come out, and you're done. Those are the fates. Nobody can change the fates, not even the so-called gods, the Olympian gods. Zeus cannot change fate. None of the gods can. It is so. It can't be otherwise. It makes life very deterministic, fatalistic. We associate fatalism with negative things, and, and rightly so. But it doesn't necessarily mean that. It just means that there is no escaping your current circumstances. It is as it's fated to be. You do not. You're not the author of your own fate. And the gods had, it, come, it had come to the year in which the gods had spun for him his time of homecoming. So we know that he's going to get home, first of all, because it's been fated. But the gods are still angry at him. Now, this will talk, we're going to talk about what goes on theologically here then. Because the fates have said Zeus, uh, Odysseus is coming home. But the gods are resisting that. And the chief among them is Poseidon. Poseidon does not want him ever to get home. He is really angry at him. We're not... We don't know why yet, we're going to find out. But Poseidon, the earth shaker, will not let Odysseus get home. The other gods want him back, he won't. So, Zeus is not going to thwart Poseidon. This is interesting, because Zeus is the head of the gods. Why doesn't Zeus just step in and say, the fates have made it so, so let it be so? Well, because he's worried about a war amongst the Olympian gods, I guess. He doesn't want to upset his brother. And so Odysseus is stuck. The other gods pity him because here is the great man who honored the gods and he is not even doing what's fated to happen. The other gods are upset about it, but they're acting like children, effectively. And you're gonna find that one of the striking things about the account of the gods is that they don't talk particularly admirably. But let me go back. But Poseidon was gone now to visit the far Ethiopians. Oh, good. So he's gone. Okay, well, he's gone. Get it done. Before he gets back, he's gone to the Ethiopians, most distant of men. Now, Ethiopia, where is it? Well, it's down in North Africa, below Egypt. That's the furthest extent of the known world for the Greeks. There's a place called Ethiopia there to this day. Um, most distant men who live divided, some at the setting of Hyperion, the setting of the sun, some at his rising. So Ethiopia is the whole. African continent, right? From the east to the west. The known world there, all the way out west of Spain, the Hesperides and so forth, that's, they don't know anything beyond that. And to the east, there you go. It's, that's the, the lat lines of uh, latitude there. Um, he had gone there to receive a hecatomb of bulls and rams. So they were sacrificing animals to please him and he was very pleased. There he sat at the feast and took his pleasure. Meanwhile, the other Olympian gods were gathered together in the halls of Zeus. First among them to speak was the father of gods and mortals. For he was thinking in his heart. Now, what's he thinking about? This is an, this is an important event, by the way. It may seem marginal, but it's not marginal. What is Zeus, who is the father of gods and mortals, thinking about? He was thinking in his heart of stately Agisthus, 
whom Orestes, Agamemnon's far-famed son, had murdered. Why is he talking about that? We're going to find out by reading on. But it's about the homecoming of another hero. Who is the hero? Agamemnon. What happened when he got home? He found that his wife was shacked up with another man. And what did they do? The two of them plotted together to kill Agamemnon and succeeded in doing so. And then the son avenged his father's murder by killing them both, mom and adulterous man. Killed them both, and the gods were happy at this outcome. However, the mother had been murdered, so it wasn't quite so simple, because he's killed his mother. That's also in defiance of the gods' will. So this is a problem here. But this is the account. It's a, it's a different homecoming. Now what we have here is foreshadowing, dramatic foreshadowing. Here's an event, a sort of homecoming, in which one of the Greek heroes comes home and he meets a terrible ending. That could also happen to Odysseus, is being suggested, right? Because, and we're gonna see why that might be plausible in a few minutes, because in fact there are suitors who are going to be like this character of uh, Aegisthus, trying to marry or coerce even um, Penelope into marrying them. And what will happen to Odysseus? Are they gonna murder him as well? We're gonna find out. But he says this, this is Zeus, oh for shame, how the mortals put the blame upon us, gods, for they say evils come from us, but it is they, rather, who by their own recklessness win sorrow beyond what is given. As now lately, beyond what was given, Aegisthus married the wife of Atreus's son, that is Agamemnon, and murdered him on his homecoming, though he knew it was sheer destruction, for we ourselves had told him, sending Hermes, the mighty watcher, Argaephontes, slayer of Argos, not to kill the man, nor court his lady for marriage, for vengeance would come on him from Orestes, son of Atreides, again Agamemnon. This is one of the complicated things here. Atreides is, is Agamemnon, and so is Atreus' son. Atreides' father is referred to as the son of this guy and also by a different name. All of them referring to Agamemnon. But don't kill him, don't marry his wife, or his son is going to murder you. I'm telling you right now, don't do it. And then he goes and does it. And they're blaming the gods for it. This is absurd. We, are, we told them, we warned them in advance, don't do this. They did it anyway, and now they're still blaming us. How, how dare they? So Zeus is complaining that he's being treated unfairly. Oh, poor Zeus. Whenever he came of age and longed for his own country. So Hermes did told him, but for all his kind intention, he could not persuade the mind of Aegisthus. And now he is paid for everything. Then in turn, the goddess, gray-eyed Athene, answered him. Now Athene is a very important figure, represented by an owl. She is the guardian or the favored god, goddess of Athens, closely connected with it. And uh, she's the goddess of wisdom. She's also the goddess that particularly cares about Odysseus, one of Zeus's daughters. Uh, she sprang out of Zeus's head, by the way. That's how she came to birth. So connected with, with wisdom thereby. And so what does she say? Son of Kronos, our father, O lordliest of the mighty, I guess thus indeed has been struck down in a death well merited. Let any other man who does thus perish as he did. But the heart in me is torn for the sake of wise Odysseus unhappy man who still far from his friends is suffering griefs on the sea washed island the navel of all the waters the navel of all the waters so in the midst of the whole of the universe right in this in the center of the navel that's where odysseus is who knows where the navel is in the midst of all the waters but it's somewhere here i don't know if it's here or not or is it palermo i can't remember exactly if I had the numbers there, it probably would explain it for me. But that's where he's stuck. 
a wooded island, and there a goddess has made her dwelling place. She is daughter of malignant Atlas, another god, who has discovered all the depths of the sea and himself sustains the towering columns which bracket earth and sky and hold them together. So you get a bit of Greek cosmology here. There's, a, there's Atlas holding up the waters, holding up the earth, holding up the heavens, standing underneath it all. This is his daughter. She detains the grieving unhappy man and ever with soft and flattering words she works to charm him to forget Ithaca. And yet, Odysseus, straining to get sight of the very smoke uprising from his own country, longs to die. Okay, so hold on, what's going on here? We're going to see more when I come to discuss book five and eight, but what we have here is a goddess offering immortality to a man. Infinite pleasure. She's going to allow him to drink uh, nectar and eat ambrosia, which is the food of the gods. He will live with her eternally. He will have every pleasure imaginable given to him. Odysseus. Is this not what men want? Immortality? The uh, fulfillment of every carnal desire? Yes, that's what their men, men are, but not Odysseus. This is not what he wants. This is part of the greatness of Odysseus. He is more than uh, his sensual nature. This is one of the things, the reasons why the Odyssey is such a great work. We hear we have a man who is not so base as to think that his whole being can be satisfied with material things, with sex, with food, etc., with money. These are of no significance to him comparatively to glory that comes from arete, from fame. That's what he's after. And so he would rather die than be immortal. I mean, the juxtaposition, the contrast could not be greater. He would rather die. But you, Olympian, says she, the heart in you is heedless of him. Did not Odysseus do you grace by the ships of the Argives, making sacrifice in wide Troy? Why, Zeus, are you now so harsh with him? So the daughter is blaming the father. This is a common theme. She's blaming him. It's not his fault. I mean, it's the fates. She's saying, Zeus, you're responsible for all this. And she knows he doesn't have omnipotence, but she's acting as if he did. And he doesn't like the accusation. Then in turn, Zeus, who gathers the clouds, made answer, my child, what sort of word escaped your teeth's barrier? How could I forget Odysseus, the godlike? He who is beyond all other men in mind, and who beyond others has given sacrifice to the gods who hold wide heaven. So he's beyond all other men in mind. He's famous for his mind. We just talked about that. He's going to deny his physical pleasures, even eternal life. He's going to deny those in favor of something greater than that. He wants honor. He wants valor. He wants virtue. But it's not my fault. It is the earth encircler Poseidon, who ever relentless nurses a grudge because of the Cyclops, whose eye he blinded. Who's the Cyclops? Well, it's Poseidon's son. For Polyphemus, like a god whose power is greatest over all the Cyclops, Theusa, a nymph, was his mother, and she was the daughter, daughter of Phorcus, lord of the barren salt water. She, in the hollows of the caves, had lain with Poseidon, for his sake, Poseidon, shaker of the earth, although he does not kill Odysseus, yet drives him back from the land of his fathers. But come, let all of us who are here work out his homecoming and see to it that he returns. Poseidon shall, be, shall put away his anger for all alone and against the will of the other immortal gods united, he can accomplish nothing. So Zeus seems to be he has something called the Aegis, the A-E-G-I-S, which gives a sort of a power. The other gods are afraid when he does this. It's, I guess if you watch the Marvel comics, it's like uh, when uh, Thor gets the hammer. He goes, mm, got the hammer now, watch out. Um, that's in the north, something like this. He has the Aegis on him. The other gods are in dread of him, but he is not omnipotent. He's just one of the gods. 
He's just the strongest of them, but not strong enough, apparently, to exert his will over the others. But united, we all will. Zeus is a sort of politician. Then, in turn, the goddess, gray-eyed Athena, answered him, and is a model for politicians, by the way. This, this uh, book, which I've said is a, a religious text, a great cultural text, is also a political manual in some ways. This is how you behave politically. Sure, he's the strongest, but is it wise to just act autocratically? Or is it better to bring people along with you? And the answer is the latter. By the way, the Homer was regarded as the teacher of all Greece. They weren't just entertained, they were educated when they read Homer. Sort of a Bible, an analogy there. But he says, okay. Uh, and, and Athena is satisfied with this, and she says, Son of Cronos, our father, O lordliest of the mighty, if in truth this is pleasing to the blessed immortals, that Odysseus of the many designs shall return home, then let us dispatch Hermes. Okay, so what's going on here? She got a concession that he's going to do it. Now she's going to make sure that it happens. <laughs> she's used to him saying things to placate her and then going away and not doing it. Well, let's make sure that this happens this time. Send Hermes, because he's going to get there very quickly. And once he's got there, the action is in motion. And we, he's not going to be able to find a way of tricking me and not doing what he just said he was going to do. He's a politician. Does she trust her own father? No, she does not. Send Hermes. And he, the guide, the slayer of Argos, to that island of Ogygia, so that with all speed he may announce to the lovely-haired nymph our absolute purpose, the homecoming of enduring Odysseus, that he shall come back. But I shall make my way to Ithaca. Okay, so Hermes is going to go to Ogygia, where Odysseus is. We will find that event happening in book five. Here, we're going to deal with what Athena does. What does Athena do? She goes to Ithaca, where Odysseus is from. Ithaca being over here, here, west coast, Greece, little island. She's going to go there. And when she is there, she is going to see what's going on and make, make the place ready for him to come back. I will make my way to Ithaca so that I may stir up his son a little and put some confidence in him to summon into assembly the flowing-haired Achaeans and make a statement to all the suitors who now forever slaughter his crowding sheep and lumbering horn-curved cattle. And I will convey him into Sparta and into Sandy Pylos to ask after his dear father's homecoming if he can hear something and so that among people he may win a good reputation. Okay, so she's going to go back home and prepare the sun. Part of the father's fame and repute is that he has a good son. And this guy is a deadbeat. He's been 20 years without his father. He doesn't know how to act. You have to understand something about Greek education here, which is true of education in general, is that it tends to happen through modeling, role modeling. If you don't have father at home, you don't have anybody to model yourself after. You model yourself after other men. What sort of men do young men admire? Well, they admire athletes and pop stars and whatever, anybody who's a celebrity. Are they good role models? No, they are not. That is not a good example. But if you have no father at home, what are you going to do? He's without a guide in how to live his life. He's without a proper education. Now, education here needs to be expanded beyond the way we usually think about it as just conveying information. It's about how to live your life. And you learn how to live your life by following another person who lives his life well. And the Greek word for this at type of education, is paideia. Very important word. This book, The Odyssey, I said is a great narrative with a hero at the center, but it is there to educate the young. It is encyclopedic. Oh, what is it? Encyclopedic, how do you spell encyclopedia? Well, 
what did you notice about Encyclopedia? Oh. It's all the information that you're going to need around all things for children. But what an encyclopedia will never do is provide you with a personal moral example. It's just a book. But it, an epic is encyclopedic in its scope. And yet it has role models in it because all education happens through personal moral example. All good education. Um, in Ephesians 6 verse 4, it talks about fathers and children. It says, fathers, bring up your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. One translation. The word is paideia. And nuthesia. You're to bring up your, that's fathers, you're supposed to do that. Be a moral example, but also teach of God's ways. Right? But you have to do this. Um, who's the model of the Christian faith? Jesus, what are we supposed to do? Follow him. What does that mean? Well, you can just follow on behind him if that's what's meant, but I think a little bit more is meant than that. We're to be like, there's a moral example. You're supposed to be like him in his character, not just in his path in life. There's a, an example, a moral example being there. The Apostle Paul says to others, even though he is a follower of Jesus, he says, follow me. Follow my teaching. Watch your, and he says, watch your life and watch your doctrine. Imitate, he says, imitate me. Do as I do. This model of education has been lost in the Western world. Or willfully neglected. It, it's extraordinary that it happened, but it has happened. Because... This is a theme you'll see if you're with me through the whole of uh, next semester. We're going to find characteristic of Western literature as it develops that the model of hero is not somebody that we're aspiring to be like, but rather we are the heroes in our own story. Because the hero is not somebody who has a father or a father figure or a mentor. By the way, Adis Athena comes in the guise of an old man whose name is, wait for it, Mentor, that's where we get the word mentoring from, from this, comes in the guise of mentor. It, the role model is instead us. We are orphans. If you think about the fiction of the last 200 years, the heroes are all orphans. They have no father. They have no parents. They have no role models. They are going to figure out themselves, for themselves, just like all of the Marvel superhero comic figures and Harry Potter and all the rest of them. They're all orphans. They have no role model and what's being implied is that they should not follow anybody else's example. They should do what they want to do, what they feel is right, because they know best. You know best. Well, you, you, how do you feel? If you ask me what you should do and I answer, well, what do you think? You're not gonna be very happy with me. I will ask you that, by the way, in return, because I think it's an important factor in it. Um, all the same, if I can't give you an answer, it's a problem. I should be able to give you an answer. I, I, you, you, but on the other hand, when you're asked that question, you want the person to come to the right conclusion, and so you might have a little conversation about it, so that you come to the right conclusion and, and, and think it through and so forth. But me telling you what to do is you acting like a child and not like an adult. You have to make that decision for yourself and walk in that path. And you have to decide to do it. But still, you should be led to, yes, there's an example, and we can talk about examples, and here's how they've ended well, and here's how they ended badly. Well, here we have the account of a, of a good man and how he acted. In Jesus, we have the good man and how he acted. Likewise, Paul, likewise, Christian martyrs, likewise, countless figures. In modern fiction, we have people who are doing, working it out for themselves. And that's your role model. That's the model that you've been presented. So if you're an orphan at home or you've grown up without a father, uh, parents, um, that's being presented as the ideal heroic state. Well, now you can really be yourself. So you got nobody in your way. There's nobody telling you what to do. Need a question at the back, or? Yeah, I was just uh, watching the live action Pinocchio. I Pinocchio? I have not seen it. Is 
Not a real boy. Yes. He's there, but he's not really helpful. And he certainly doesn't try and be like Geppetto. Yeah, well, he might, we might say if he sends him to school, he wants the worst for him, but that's a, that's enough. <laughs> He gets caught up in all the wrong crowds and all that sort of stuff, right? But you will find the same thing in uh, story after story for the last couple hundred years. And it's a significant, when I say a significant departure from the past, it is a total repudiation of everything that's been taught about how to live a good life. Do what you think is best is bad advice, is very bad advice. If you are put in the position of do whatever you like, you're going to be Odysseus on the island with the nymph. Because every bodily desire you ever have, everything you lust after, is going to be satisfied eternally. Isn't that great? Do what you want. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's what he would have done. Did he do that? Oh, no, he didn't. So this is a model for us. This is why he's a hero. I mean, it seems sort of odd, but how, how do we relate to a man with a nymph? Well, I'm not a man with a nymph, so that's not, like, it's irrelevant. Ah, but the principle is not irrelevant. And it's not even for men only. You can say women have the same sorts of temptations. Similar and different, right? But the same sorts of things. What's the best thing to do? And does Odysseus do the best thing? And the answer is yes, he does. He is the model of what's best to do. But his son is left without a father. Now, Odysseus is a full-grown man. He had a father. He grew up with a father. He knows how to act. He is the finished article, but he just can't get home. But his son has no idea. And so she, Athena, is going to go back to him and get him going. And what's the first thing she does? Well, she stirs him up a little bit. And how does she do it? She appears in this the guise of a visitor, an old man, mentor, wise old man. And she's going to get him going, and, what, and she gets him to speak out in public, which he's never done before. When he speaks in public, they're shocked. And even his mother is shocked. And he tells her, you know, go back to your loom, mom. And she's like, this is my little boy, and here's talking like a man. She, she's shocked. And he's probably shocked. He's, he, he's been ignored and probably uh, mocked, reviled by the suitors up till now. They think he's insignificant. Suddenly, they look at the, him and they're thinking, you know what, he's 20 years old, and I never thought of it before, but he looks an awful like, uh, like his father. And his father is a formidable man. We better take care of this man because suddenly he's a threat. We didn't perceive him as a threat, and that's because he wasn't a threat. He just had muscles. That's not helping you at all without character. And he's developing a little character. Okay, so now he's dangerous. So what does she then do? She takes him away. She takes him from, where is it? Ithaca, and she's going to go up uh, over to Sparta, where the Spartans are, the famous Spartans. And that's where she meets another hero whose name is Menelaus. Menelaus is the red-haired brother of Agamemnon. And he got home. And she, and so what's she doing? Well, she's providing an example. She's giving him courage. She's providing a, a, a role model and example. And she's getting him out from under his mother's skirts. Get out of your house. Go find out something about the world because what you're going to do in the process is learn something about yourself. Sends him away. Now, this is part of the process of him becoming mature. This is what, again, you have left your homes in many cases. It's a challenging period. It's part of the coming of age process. It's a dangerous, scary process sometimes in certain ways. Lots of different new things with little guidance parents are not about. You probably stopped listening to them anyway. Maybe you shouldn't have. You may, you know, when you get to a certain age, the older you get, the uh, wiser your parents sound. 
And boy, you get suddenly got wise. I'm like, no, you just stop being so stupid. My parents often, in hindsight, sound a little bit uh, wiser than they once, you once thought they were. Boy, mom and dad, you really grew up. <laughs> oh, thank you. No, that's not how it works. So he's going to go away, and he's being prepared for his father to come home. When his father comes home, what sort of son is he going to meet? He's not ready yet. So the education of this young man, whose name is Telemachus, is the first four books. It's, it's often called the Telemachy by critics, because it's a, it's a book within the whole book. He's a minor character, but he's not insignificant. This is the heir of Ithaca, after all. And part of the uh, excellence of Odysseus is to have a noble son who will carry on his legacy. Like, how many people do we know, great men who have scandalous, disappointing children? David? David? Well, although Solomon is a pretty famous example, but there, the, the, you could, the numbers uh, will be legion. Usually great men are so focused on their own uh, work that they don't attend to their children. They leave the they don't tend and keep. It's part of the Garden of Eden is to guard, make sure you cultivate the kids in your home. If you're going to send your kids to other teachers, like Geppetto, make sure the teachers are going to do what you want them to do and going to follow your values and not just do what they want with your little wooden boy and carve pieces off him and like make your little boy into a wooden girl or who knows what they're going to do with the boy. Right? You're going to do whatever you're going to do to the... Pinocchio, you can do it. You can cut his nose off. Oh, it's too long. Oh, we can do a little nose surgery for you. We can take care of that lying problem. Well, actually, you didn't take care of the lying problem. You took care of the nose problem. I, right? It just doesn't indicate anymore that he's lying. He has a moral problem. Right? You can't correct moral problems with surgery. <laughs> um, but she is going to go and do this. She tells this. Now, I, I'm skipping over this a little bit, but um, I, I just wanted to give you a, a gist of the whole thing. And she comes, and it says disguised as mentes or mentor, depending on which uh, case it's in. Uh, 105, it says mentes, but I wish he had uh, used the word mentor there, but that is what's intended. His name is mentor. So wise older figure, like his father would have been. But now he's, he's even older than that. This is an old man. You expect wisdom from old people. You expect it. Whether you get it depends on whether they've acted wisely in their walk in life. They exist. They're probably in, they're people in your church that you ignore. Unless you go to a youth church in which everybody's your age, in which case you're not going to get wisdom from anyone because they're all like you. Uh, some of them wiser than others, but still at a stage when they're hardly going to give you the counsel of years and experience. But she finds there when she sees him, what? The haughty suitors. They're proud. They're arrogant. What are they doing? What's the crime? They're eating him out of house and home. They're, they're impoverishing Odysseus. They are abusing their hospitality. Hospitality is an important attribute in the ancient world, throughout uh, Greece, throughout the Middle East, hospitality is uh, a requirement. You must show hospitality, okay? But there's a, there's a duty placed on the guest as well, which is to show respect to those who are being your hosts. They are doing the opposite. They're abusing the hospitality. They stay. They keep eating. They keep drinking. They're sleeping with the servant girls scandalous and there's no reckoning or there's no you know there's no justice they're just going to keep on doing it and and Penelope who you know she's the queen here she can't do anything about it so she feels helpless now what we find here and this is one of the things that so there's so many layers to this story and it's fascinating uh, because of the layers is that each of the characters that are here, so Odysseus is the main character. He is like a, um, um, Athena because he's wise. He's a model of wisdom. 
But he's not the only one who follows in the footsteps of Athena, although he is the best example of that. There are other wise figures, and one of them is Penelope. Penelope is a wise character. In fact, we're gonna, so I'm not gonna give it away. We'll find uh, the, when Odysseus and Penelope get together, the interaction is rather amusing, to put it mildly, because they both try and outfox the other. I won't give it away, you're still reading. But here she uses one of the features of Athena and also Odysseus, which is cunning. And what she says to the suitors, they keep saying to her, marry me, marry me, marry me. And she says, I don't want to. And she said, well, you're going to anyway. That's not an acceptable answer. And she says, okay, I will marry you. But first, let me finish a shroud that I've been preparing for my father-in-law, Laertes. He's about to die. And I, as a dutiful wife, need to honor my husband's father. So let me do that. And when I'm done with the shroud, then I'll marry one of you. And they say, okay. <laughs> Drinking the wine, they go, okay. That goes on for three years. Now, after a while, you would have thought even good wine, they might have occurred to them, you know, boy, it's taking a long time for that shroud, but it doesn't matter. They're happy. They're getting everything that Odysseus uh, rejected. Bodily pleasures. They're getting everything that, so they are, the antithesis of Odysseus. He had wine, he had pleasure, he even had immortality. He had everything he wanted there, he didn't want that. They want all that, so they, they are his moral opposite. Despicable characters. And they have not figured out that Penelope's three years of weaving haven't finished the shroud yet. Why? Well, because by day she's busy on her loom weaving the shroud and at night she undoes it all. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. English ditty there. You've heard it before, right? Penelope, she's the, the strategist here, just like Odysseus. He's got, the, he's got the Trojan horse. She's got the web that she weaves there. She is wise. She knows how to use her cunning, and she's keeping them at bay using her mind, right? She's not stronger than them. She's smarter than them. They are, right? Admirable, admirable. So she is a model for women in how she behaves. So watch to that, very interesting. They're not supposed to go out like Ring of Powers Galadriel and slay men on the battlefield. That's unrealistic and stupid. Women don't act like that. They can't act like that. That's not, that, you know, that's not equality. That's just sameness, it's, no. Also an atrocity to Tolkien, but uh, let me not get off track and start talking about rings of power. That way lies madness. But she is admirable in her own sphere, and we're going to find that this young man, who I talked about already, Telemachus, is likewise going to be so. And the example that is put before him, the story that is told to him, is the one that's told over and over and over, which is what happened to Agamemnon when he got home. And what happened? And what happened is a Gis, uh, Orestes, rather, who's Agamemnon's son, avenged his father against the unjust, uh, adulterous man. And the, the suitors are threatening to be exactly that. They want to lie with his mother. You make sure you take them out. That's the example. The gods praise that example. This is what Athena wants him to do. When, they, when your father comes home, you take these guys out. And it's pretty bloody, it's pretty awful, but it's saying something uh, not about explicitly about vengeance per se. It's about dealing in a broader moral sense, virtue and vice. How do you deal with sin? They don't use the category of sin, but I'm gonna use it. How do you deal with it? Do you allow it to you know, just tamp it down a little bit, you just push it away, or do you root it out radically? Are you not gonna tolerate it?
Well, the Odyssey doesn't agree with you. Homer doesn't agree with you. What does Jesus say about dealing with sin? That's the question. He says, if your eye offends you, you pluck it out. And if you're... Um, and furthermore, that the lusts begin in the human heart. So if you even look on a woman with adulterous looks, then pluck your eye out. So he seems pretty radical. Now, he doesn't mean that you should be plucking your eyes out because there would be a lot of blind men around. In fact, everybody would be blind at that point. That's not what he's talking about. But he is talking, right? So it's not to be taken literally. It is to be taken literally in the sense of there is no tolerance for it whatsoever. You must utterly eradicate this from your life if you're to be like me because that's the point. Jesus does not do this. He not only doesn't commit adultery, he doesn't incline towards that. So you got, you've got to kill the inclination even. And there's something of the sort being said here. I'm not saying that it's the same thing, but it's that same sort of severity. Do not tolerate uh, injustice in your realm. None. Get it gone altogether. Now, it sounds on a human level very harsh. And when we come to the actual scene, you're going to find it bloody. But think of it on at the moral level of teaching. You will not intolerate. You will not tolerate injustice. Get rid of it entirely, and you will show that you are just. That's the moral teaching in the Odyssey. It's interesting at that level. I don't think it's saying that you should go if somebody that you find injustice, you should go around slaughtering them all. If it did, we would find that the Greek history was full of nothing but this, and there isn't that. So they clearly understand. This is spiritual teaching and not advice on how to deal with your conflicts. You know, go around shooting arrows into everybody's throats. Make sure they're all dead. That's not what is being said. It is being said there is something radically wrong about injustice and you will have no tolerance for it at all. None. It's strong moral teaching. Right? Well, today we're, we are told to tolerate things. And um, there is a theological uh, position being taught there, for sure. And uh, it's called pantheism, which is that good and evil are essentially indistinguishable, or that they're just shades of the same thing, 50 shades of gray. The difference between good and evil, it depends on where you're standing. Um, cancer kills a man a murderer kills a man why do we condemn the murderer and not the cancer well we do okay um, but do we see it as the same sort of thing how about flip it around on the curing side uh, if I uh, harm you in there, or if, if healing you includes harming you, what's the difference between harming and healing? There is no difference. There has to be a difference, however. It's part of the Hippocratic Oath. First, first lesson of the Hippocratic Oath medical doctors would have taken it from the time of the Greeks is first do no harm. So you're going to help this character? First do no harm. That's so there's a, a clear, bright red line there. You can't do that. So health cannot include harm. We no longer swear that oath, by the way. Doctors do not swear that aspect of the Hippocratic Oath. It's been pulled out, out of the oath. So it can, can include harm. So we are, we're healing you, yes, but you're also not forbidding the idea of harming me. That's a very big problem. That's a moral problem. You talked about the present world. There's my example there. But I say pantheism because, again, it sees that, that uh, good and evil depends to some degree on your perspective, where you stand on the issue. N not in Homer, not in Scripture. There is a clear right and a clear wrong. And there, it's not a matter of perspective. That's how it's being presented. Uh, any other comments or questions? I, I've dealt with the first four books, believe it or not giving you a synopsis of it at any rate. And I'll talk about other features there. But any other comments or questions at this stage?
of course. So one of the fascinating things about this, this is, this, is a, this is the goddess of wisdom. Now she counsels killing and stuff like that, and you think, what does this have to do with the goddess of wisdom? But it is the goddess of wisdom at the end of the day. And Odysseus is known for his wisdom. Penelope is known for his wisdom. All the characters being pushed in the Odyssey is the virtue of wisdom. With wisdom comes discernment, right? Which is one of the chief marks, if not the chief mark of the Holy Spirit, is discernment. It doesn't mean certain action, in, in, inevitably, as a matter of, that's part of the discernment process. But developing the mind of Christ in you, yes, that's what you're here to do. This is a great testing ground in some ways. You get to spend four years at university and really not be challenged too much in terms of having to do many of the things you'll have to do for the rest of your life. You actually get to read books and think about them. And I, I would encourage you to take that privilege very seriously because it will, if you do that, at the end of four years, you are a very different person than when you got here. You, it's transformative. Um, and that is what you do. And yeah, meeting other people, well, yes. Then you'll have to consider, consider context, situation, all those sorts of things. But if you don't think that there's any essential difference between right and wrong, you have problems. That's not the position I'm going to be presenting in the class. I don't think it's the Christian position. I don't think it's the Greeks position, for that matter. They clearly thought there was right and wrong. And the goddess of wisdom came down to make sure that right was upheld and wrong was punished. That's justice. That's good. That's what we have here. It was the model for all the Greeks, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so I'll see you next class.